Well, welcome. It's good to have you once again from your homes, being able to tune in to us here at Calvary Chapel, Roma Land, as we continue to worship the Lord during this time of testing and trial. We're praying for all of you at home. We miss you and not being able to be with you collectively here in the sanctuary, but it's good to be with you through the video and being able to connect with one another through phone and FaceTime and being able to just have that fellowship of the body of Christ during uh, this season. So would you pray with me as we begin our time together of worshiping the Lord. Father, we come before you and thank you for who you are and for your love for us. For you, Jesus, and your sacrifice for us. And God, Holy Spirit, for being able to come and comfort us, being our helper in this time of need. We ask that you would be blessed and that you would be glorified in our service this morning. And that you would reach out and wrap your arms around all of our loved ones as we wait for the time when we can be together again to worship you. We give you thanks for this morning, and it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Brandon's going to lead us in some worship again this morning, and so would you all just prepare your hearts to be before the Lord.
Good morning, and welcome to Calvary Chapel Romo, and thank you uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, we'd like uh, to just uh, remind the church body, uh, the men here at Calvary Chapel Romoland, that Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, our men's Bible study, which is called Calling All Men, All men Online, will be at 7 p.m. If you'd like any information, you can call the office at 951-943-7097. And before we begin, church, with a message from our senior pastor, Pastor Jerry Brown, we would just like to remind the body of Christ that many missionaries all over the world depend upon the faithfulness of the saints of this church. And we would not want to rob the saints of the God-given opportunity that Jesus Christ gives us to give. And so I would like to read a verse from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will be no room enough to receive it. And so this morning we would like to pray for our tithes and offerings. But before doing that, just a quick reminder that you can send your tithes and offerings through the mail for Calvary Chapel Romoland to the U-Turn for Christ office, which is 20170 Patterson Avenue, Paris, California, 92570. Or if you wish to give online, you can go to our Calvary Chapel Romoland website, which is CCR. Romoland.org, or you can give at the U Turn for Christ website, which is U Turn for Christ.com. Let us pray. And Father, we pray this morning, God, that you would just continue, Lord, blessing this church. Father, we love you, Lord, and we get a chance to give back to you. And Lord, as you've been faithful to us, Lord, allow the church body here at Calvary Chapel Romoland to be faithful, Father, to you. Father, bless uh, the message this morning. Allow it to be uh, one that's anointed, Father, and that would speak to the church body. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. All right, church. Well, once again, welcome. What a blessing it is to be with you this morning. I want to thank Brandon once again for leading us in worship as Pastor John Reno. Some have been asking about Pastor John Reno. He's been very sick, uh, but he does not have the virus. He's just been very sick with the flu. And so uh, we're blessed to have Brandon here to lead us in worship this morning. And one of the things that I'm so excited about is the gift of the Holy Spirit and Him moving within the body. We've had uh, some podcasts every day on the website of Calvary Chapel Romoland, Facebook, uh, Calvary Chapel Romoland, and U-Turn for Christ. And uh, the body is being used to encourage one another. And what a blessing that is. And this morning, what a blessing it is to be able to have the Holy Spirit working through Brandon. Brandon and I did not talk about the songs that he would be choosing to lead us in worship. But this morning, the Holy Spirit being very prompt to have us worshiping and singing holy, holy, holy. And what a blessing it is because that's the message and the title of the message this morning. God is holy. And so this morning, I just want to remind you that in this time of us going through this difficulty with the coronavirus, it's exciting for me to be able to watch as the church just enlarges its capacity and uh, is innovative in how it is that we bring messages to one another and encourage one another. And so we've survived another week with the help of the Lord from this uh, virus and uh, in your places of residence, I pray that you are being safe and kept healthy as we continue to move through it. But it is to the Lord 
that we need to run during these times, let me remind you of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 this morning where it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so it is to the Lord that we run. It is to the Lord that you and I continue to cry out for His help. And being able to bring a healing to those that have been infected and to bring comfort to those especially that have lost loved ones and to bring safety to all of us that have not. We continue to cry out in prayer to the Lord with all of you as we face this battle, not as those who have no hope, but those that know we have hope in the Lord Jesus and especially in our final victory. And so church, may we share that answer with the world around us. I believe that this is a time like never before in our lifetime with people gripped with fear and especially uncertainty that you and I have the opportunity to be able to speak to them about having peace in Jesus. Let me remind you of a few verses in Romans if you want to turn in your Bibles there while you're home. Romans chapter 10. And I remind you of a few verses that the Apostle Paul gave to us to be able to help us in these times because it is so important that we take the opportunity in the midst of all the fear and uncertainty to be able to share with the world around us the Lord Jesus. Here's what Paul wrote, chapter 10 and verse 8. He said, but what does it say? The Word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the Word of faith which we preached. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's important for us to start with these verses this morning as we look at the epidemic that is around us and for us to be excited about not being like others that are gripped with fear, but have a confidence in the Lord Jesus and our relationship with Him. We are not gripped with fear, We are to be safe, we are to be careful, but not to allow for fear to overwhelm us because of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and Him being the Messiah of the Word, of the world. Please, hear me this morning. I think it's so important that in a time like this that we show the world around us the hope that we have in Christ and share with them that hope so that they don't lose heart in the middle of the battle as well. I personally believe, like never before, that we have that opportunity to be able to insert Jesus into every conversation that we have, allowing for others to be able to have the peace that you and I know and the confidence of being those that are in Christ Jesus. It is that God has called us to be, the church to be, the carrier of His gospel to the people around us. I remind you in the book of Esther in chapter 4, you remember when Mordecai spoke to Esther when he was talking to her about being used by the Lord to save Israel. And in Esther chapter 4, verse 14, we read these words. For if you remain completely silent at this time, 
Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I believe that the Lord is giving us opportunity to be used in such a time as this. You can imagine with me, can't you? As I was talking with one of our sisters in the Lord uh, this week, and she was reminding me, Pastor, you know, God has stripped us away from all these other gods that we've worshipped. How it is that God uses even this virus to be able to bring us to our knees, to have us come to attention, no longer bowing down and worshiping pro-athletes in a coliseum, or no longer, if you will, bowing down and worshiping movie stars in a theater, <clears throat> or if you will, no longer bowing down and worshiping at the bars and uh, at the different uh, clubs that are around the country, but coming to bow before the true King of kings and Lord of lords. I believe it is a great time and a call really for us to be able to speak to our members in the body of Christ, to our neighbors, to our family, to our classmates and co-workers, and even, even if you will, in the grocery stores, to a absolute stranger. What a blessing it is for us to be able to speak to them and to watch as they might bow their heads before the Lord and be saved, ready to be able to experience the abundant life that Christ came and died for us to experience and then to know that they will enter into the kingdom of God eventually for all of eternity. It is a time for us to be able to speak of Jesus in every conversation we have. Well, let's turn to our Bibles as we continue our study in 2 Peter. And you remember last week, as we began last week, speaking about the false teachers. We'll open up once again chapter 2 and verse 1 to remind us of that passage where Peter says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift Destructions, And so the Apostle Peter, reminding us that there will be liars, there would be hypocrites, there would be charlatans that would want to take advantage of the people of God. And Jesus is speaking very clearly and saying to us, be aware through Peter. He is saying, be aware that there are going to be those that deny me as the Messiah of the world. And be careful to know the truth so that you would spot those that are speaking in error immediately. Well, we continue on in chapter 2. We're in verse 4 as we speak once again about those false teachers and about what it is that God says through Peter to us about making sure that we are not running in the same vein as they are. In verse 4 it says this, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. One of the things that we have to be able to recognize as we read through the Bible. And one of the reasons that we travel through the Bible verse by verse, if you will, chapter by chapter and book by book, is so that we don't skip any of the difficult passages, but that we continue working our way through the Bible and knowing that God wants us 
to be able to have the whole council be allowed to do the work that only it can do in bringing change in our lives. And it's a hard thing for many people to understand how a God of love would look at that verse again, cast anyone down to hell. But Peter understands the inspiration of the Holy Spirit has him write for us these very words so that we might understand that it is a clear (coughs) precept of Scripture that God will judge unrighteousness. And why is that? Well, it is because God is holy. We sang this morning, holy, holy, holy. And we are going to speak this morning about God's holiness. And one of the attributes of God's holiness is that He will judge the unrighteous. Last week I spent the whole study on false teachers. And this week I get to start once again on some more great news. But... It is what the Bible teaches, and that's what we need to know. We need to know what the Lord spoke through the Apostle Peter and him saying that if God judged fallen angels and Satan himself, he will do the same with those that continue throughout their life in rebellion against him. I read to you from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 25 and verse 41. Where the Lord says, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and for his angels. I want to make sure that as we read that verse in Matthew's Gospel, that it's very clear that hell was never intended for people. It was always intended, created for Satan and his fallen angels. And so that means that people have to choose to want to go to hell. And they choose by continuing to be rebellious to the things that God has spoken. They choose to continue being rebellious to Jesus Christ and Him being the Messiah of the world. Church, again, God is a holy God. And only righteousness can be allowed into the kingdom of God. And that's why we have to share Jesus with all of those around us. That's why we have to share Jesus in every conversation that we have. Because there is no other way to deal with mankind's sin than to deal with the Lord Jesus and them accepting Him as Messiah. I remind you of 1 John in chapter 4 and verse 10 as he tells us that it is Jesus Christ of Nazareth that deals with the sin of those who place their belief in him. 1 John in chapter 4 and verse 10 says this, "In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so let me remind you for a moment, all of us, that Satan at one time was a very special angel to God Himself. Before he became prideful and wanting to be like God, he was cast out of heaven with a third of the angels as well that were rebellious. I remind you in Isaiah of the five eyes there speaking about Lucifer or Satan. If you turn in Isaiah to chapter 14, you can read along with me once again what a blessing it is to have the pages of Scripture being turned as we continue to move through this passage together. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12 says this, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, and here are the eyes, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the furthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. And yet you shall be brought down to Sheol and to the lowest depths of the pit. And so we find that God deals with Satan and he's dealt with some of the fallen angels, putting them into a holding place called Tartus, Tartarus in this place where they will be until God ultimately casts them in to the lake of fire. Listen, it's not that we get lost in Satan and the study of the demons, but it is that we understand what Peter is saying. And what he is saying is that if God judged all of them, so He will bring judgment upon all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness will be judged by the Lord in the end. Well, as we move to verse 5, look at a couple examples that the Lord gives us of those that walked on the earth. And again, speaking to us about being a holy God and judging unrighteousness. He says this in verse 5, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Here again, Peter is once again showing us a look at God's holiness. I'd like for you to turn to Genesis with me and to chapter 6 so that you actually get to read along with me a little of the story of what was going on during the time that God had decided to bring the flood. In chapter 6 and verse 5 it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he <clears throat> was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man who I, I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What a blessing it is to be able to see the holiness of God once again, not allowing for the ancient sinful world that word is representing here, those that were continuing in that evil, sinful way. And he brought judgment on them, and yet he saved the righteous. Let me say this before we move on here, because one of my favorite things of being a student of the Word of God is believing without a shadow of doubt of the historicity of the Bible, in that we recognize that this story is not a children's story, it's not a fairy tale, it's the history of mankind given to us by the Lord Himself through Moses as he would write. Which means that there was a real Noah, there was a real ark, and there was a real flood of judgment upon a sinful world. And let me remind you that Noah and his family worked on the ark for some 120 years, the Word tells us. And he says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And so I believe that the Scripture is declaring there that the whole time of Noah building that ark, that he was preaching righteousness, calling people to repentance as he continued to build the ark. And yet only his family members would listen and repent. The Lord Jesus speaks this to us through the Hebrew writer. And I believe it's an important message for us to hear this morning. He says in 13.8 of the book of Hebrews, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Which means that our God is the same 
yesterday, today, and forever in His holiness and His judgment of the ungodly and His protection of those that trust in Him, those that believe in Him. You can see why it is so important for us to be those that are preaching a message of hope the message of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world around us right now. Peter says, God is holy and He will judge the unrighteous. And I believe that this is a time for us to call people to repentance. To be able to show them that they're not perfect, that we are all sinners, the Word says, and in need of a Savior. That we might use this opportunity to help people to come to know Jesus even as we do and be saved from their sin. Well, the Lord uses Noah in a special way to show us this and then moves from Noah to Lot. Look at verse 6 through 8 with me as we see the Lord using Sodom and Gomorrah as the unsaved, the rebellious, and Lot as one who was righteous. It says this, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul, from day to day, by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Once again, we need to recognize that God says that these cities had given themselves over to all kinds of lewdness. Let me just say very clearly, as you study through the passage, it is that they were perverted in homosexual activity and were destroyed because, once again, God is holy and He judges all sin. Notice God says He is showing them as an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And what an important message that is, that He will also judge all those that continue in their rebellion for all of their life, not accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I remind remind you of Romans this morning. You can turn to Romans 1 if you would like in your Bible once again as you read along with me. We love to have those that are in the congregation turning their Bibles to be able to see uh, the passage of Scripture that we're speaking of in their own Bibles to get familiar with them and to allow for their Bibles to be able to be their best friend. And so Romans chapter 1 and verse 24 through 27 says this, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness, in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen? For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged their natural use for what was against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of a woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their heir, which was due. Listen, church, all that Peter is wanting for us to know is that God is holy and we need to repent of our sins. We need to confess Jesus Christ as Messiah and allow the penalty of the sins that we've committed to be placed on Him at the cross of Calvary. So important for us once again this morning to be able to recognize that this is Peter's last letter to the church. And if you will, in his desperate situation, being in prison, knowing that he is going to be 
hung on a cross upside down for he asked to be hung upside down so that he wouldn't die in the same manner as our Messiah. And Peter in that desperate situation, once again, is writing the most important things to the church. And this is what's most important. Our God is a holy God. And He's called us to be holy as well. And so Peter reminds us of those that lived ungodly and what happened to them as they were in Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, that you and I have the choice to make. Will we have the penalty of sin placed on us, or will we put our trust in the Lord Jesus and allow the penalty of sin to be placed on Him? I remind you of that penalty. Romans in chapter 6 and verse 23, the Apostle Paul writes this to the church, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Someone has to pay the debt. And that's what the Scripture is saying this morning. If you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then it is paid by the blood that was shed on Calvary by Him. And you will not have any longer any debt. Jesus said to Telestai, it is paid in full when he hung on the cross. But if you refuse and rebel, the Bible teaches that your debt must be paid. And it will be paid by you being separated from a holy God for all of eternity. Let me be very clear with you here this morning, church. As you read the story of Lot in Genesis 19, we recognized that Lot was not always a prime example of a godly man. But the Word of God tells us that it is very clear he delivered righteous Lot, which means that he put his trust in God. He believed God. And it is, if you will, shown to us or evidenced by the fact that he was oppressed and tormented by all the sinful living that was around him. Isn't that exactly what the Lord does for us? As we put our trust in Him, the Word of God tells us that our sin is dealt with once and for all, and we are cloaked in the righteousness of God. I remind you of Peter or of Paul writing in 2 Corinthians in chapter 5 and verse 21, where he says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. There is only one way to enter into the kingdom of God, and it is with the righteousness of God cloaked about us because of us placing our sin in our belief in Jesus Christ on the cross and allowing for our penalty to be paid. Well, we move to verse 9, and it is, the favorite of the verses this morning that I want to pay attention to. Look at with me. It says this, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. The whole section that we're looking at this morning is really pointing to this one verse in that faithful believers and sinful, rebellious world will not be judged in the same way. Pastor Chuck Smith would say, what a glorious truth that is. And how it is such a glorious truth. How good it is that when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus, that we are promised that our sins will be forgiven. I remind you of 1 John in chapter 1 and verse 9 where the Word says, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Church, the Gospel message that we have to deliver is simply the good news. That's what Gospel means. The good news. The good news of Jesus paying the price for our sins. And that the church is the bride of Christ. 
And as the bride of Christ, we know that God's wrath will not be poured out on His bride. I remind you of 1 Thessalonians where Paul writes in chapter 5 and verse 9, For God did not appoint us, speaking to the church, to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that this is another passage of Scripture that we are looking at this morning in verse 9 that supports, if you will, the pre-tribulation rapture for all believers. One of the doctrines of the Bible that motivates me to love and to figure out how to serve the Lord as best as I can every day is the doctrine of the rapture of the church and believing that it could happen at any moment. Would you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians in your Bible and to chapter 4. Let me remind you once again of God saying that He will not appoint to wrath those that believe in Him, that trust in Him, that put their faith in Him. But in chapter 4 and verse 16, He speaks of this experience that's going to happen, this event that is going to take place. And it's called the rapture of the church. Look with me at verse 16 through 18 of chapter 4. He says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. What a blessing that is, all those that were living at the time, especially those that have come to the Lord, would understand the trumpet blast that would call to attention the armies. And he says this, And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, the word says, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Look what he says. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These words that are used here, caught up, is really harpazo in the Greek, or rapturus in the Latin. And it is the carrying the meaning, if you will, of being snatched away or quickly taken. And so we have this word before us showing us that we will be quickly taken by the Lord into the air. The blessing that we have of knowing that a rapture is going to take place where the Lord once again shows that He will not judge the righteous in the same manner that He judges the unrighteous, the rebellious. But He will call the righteous up even as He tucked uh, Noah into the ark, even as he took Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah, as used here in our study this morning, so he shall snatch the church, those that believe in him, before his wrath is poured out. Peter showing us once again what a holy God that we serve. What a holy God that would save Noah from the flood that would save Lot from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and so He will save His chosen people from the wrath that is to come. Let us share Jesus with as many people as possible and allow them to be able to experience the abundant life that Christ came and died for us to experience. And then, know that they will be with Him in heaven for all of eternity. And let us, let us be motivated by knowing that the rapture of the church could be taken place at any time where we will be caught up to be with the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father, once again we come before You and thank You for the blessing of being able to be together. To know, God, that You are such a special holy God that you cannot put up with rebellion, sin, unrighteousness. And that your holiness demands that judgment would come to those that continue to rebel. And yet, for those that put their trust in you, for those that admit 
knowing that they're a sinner and in need of a Savior, that you would, Lord, you would save us from the wrath that is to come. Thank you for being a holy God and calling us to holiness. We ask you, God, Holy Spirit, come as our comforter, come as our helper, and allow us to be the men and women that you have called us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I'd like to be able to invite you to the Lord's table with us. What a blessing it is for you to be at home and to have the opportunity to be able to have communion with your family in your home. A privilege to be dad's, the spiritual leader of your home. And so I'm going to ask you now, as Brandon comes to lead us in another worship song, that you would go and get a cup of juice, a a cracker, uh, that you can sit with your wives, husbands, that dads, you can sit with your children and your wife, and that you can experience being that spiritual leader in the home like never before, and being one that would invite them to partake in the Lord's Supper as a family. And we're going to do that here with you from the church. this morning, let me remind you of the words that have been given to us from 
the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles there, uh, you can read along with me. Because it is at this time that you and I need to stop. To be able to consider what it is that we're about to do. And to be able to remember Jesus. We don't take communion in a flippant way. We don't take it as some kind of religious exercise. But we stop to be able to have this special time. Uh, one of the two rites that the Lord gave us, the other being baptized. And to be able to think about, as He has called us to, remember Him when we partake in this special communion time. In chapter 11, in verse 23, the Apostle Paul writing once again says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which He was betrayed took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat. This is My body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. And in the same manner, He also took the cup after supper, saying, Take this cup. It is the new covenant in My blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of Me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. The blessing for us to be able to have this privileged time of being able to remember. And even as the Lord on that last night before He was betrayed had that special time with His disciples. So He wants to have that special time with each of us. He wants for us to be able to recognize that that fellowship, that sweetness was one of of mixing actually even their germs at the time as they would dip into the same bowl their bread and to be able to eat together as they would drink from the cup that he would pass. It was a, a pointed showing, if you will, of the Lord Jesus being one with his disciples. And so he is one with all of us. And this morning, as we hold that bread in our hand, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we know your body was broken. It was bruised. Your beard ripped out. The thorn smashed into your skull. God, you hung on a cross so that our sins might be forgiven. And as we take this bread... We do it in remembrance of all that you are and all that you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may partake. And the Word says that He took the cup. And He said that it is in the blood that there is life. The new covenant. The covenant of grace that allows for anyone that would put their trust in this blood that he shed. This cup represents his blood. It's a symbol of his blood being shed on Calvary. It's a symbol of the way in which all of our sins can be forgiven. And that we can move from unrighteousness to righteousness. As we commit our lives to him as Lord. Let us remember as we take the cup and let us pray. Father, once again we come before you to thank you for who you are. And we thank you, Jesus, for your obedience to the point of the death on the cross, for your blood being shed for the remission of sins. We thank you for that obedience, Lord, and knowing that there will be those that place their trust in you, and we put our trust in you. We proclaim today your death on that cross, your resurrection from the grave, your sitting at the right hand of the Father, and Lord, 
we expectantly await your return to the clouds to rapture us into the heavens to be with you. And it's in those thoughts that we partake in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, thank you for being with us this morning. We pray that you would be encouraged, that you would be strengthened today, and that you would remember today is a day of salvation. Today is a day to be able to speak out of your mouth, to live out your life, so that all around you see the light of Jesus Christ. God bless you. We look forward to being with you soon. And until then, we'll continue to bring you the word through the airway.